Hunter Church, thank you so much for being here today. My name is Hunter. We are super excited that you are here to spend your Sunday morning with us. Uh, we have a couple quick things to go through, though, before we hop into the worship and teaching and all that good stuff that we have planned for today. Uh, so first things first, if you are new and you've been coming for a few weeks, a few months, uh, maybe even a year and you've never filled out a Connect card, uh, we would love to get to know who you are and help you get connected here at NEO. Uh, so there's a QR code all throughout the building. It's in the seat back chair in front of you. Um, it's on the screen right now. If you scan that and hit the button that says Connect, we would love to get to know who you are and help you get connected here at NEO. Uh, we have groups that meet all throughout the week, small groups, men and women's groups. We have a youth group that meets on Sunday night. There's lots of ways to get connected here. Um, and so we would love to help you with that this week. Uh, also on that QR code, you can give online. It is super quick and easy to give online. Um, it's an easy way to do it, but if you do prefer to give in person, um, there's little boxes all throughout the building on the wall. They look just like this. If you uh, want to drop an in-person gift, that's the best way to do that while you are here today as well. Um, there's a lot of things that go on throughout the weeks and months here at NEO, but different events for different groups, all that good stuff. Um, so if you want to know about what we have coming up, hit that QR code as well. It definitely will let you know all the stuff that is coming up in the next few weeks and months here. Um, the last thing, if you have a baby all the way to a sixth grader, get them dropped off down at NEO Kids or Switch, which is back this way. Um, we would love to hang out with them this morning and teach them God's word at their level. So make sure you get them dropped off um, and so you can enjoy the service. So um, it's about to begin in just a few seconds. So if you're getting coffee, if you're talking to somebody, begin to wrap that up because you do not want to miss what we have planned for this morning. Uh, thank you so much for being here. God bless. Peace. Pay that price. Friday 
Church, he is risen. Amen. Welcome to Easter Sunday. We're just so excited. We finally made it here. What an incredible time to worship the risen Savior. Not that every Sunday isn't, but this one is special. This is the one where Jesus stole the keys of hell and death, paid our debt for all of eternity and invites us to live with him forever. So we're gonna to sing today harder and louder than we ever have before. Does that sound all right? Yes. Let's do it, all right. So this is Philippians 2, it says this. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, 
who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. But for this reason, church, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's sing. Still close, the work is finished. 
powerful name indeed it is, Jesus. Lord, you who are seated in the highest place, above all rulers, all authorities, all principalities over heaven and earth, Lord. So everything that we are and everything that we have today, Lord, belongs to you. Please receive the highest praise today, Jesus. This King of Kings, thank you for freeing us from the grave, Lord, for bearing our shame and all of our sin, Lord. We'll spend eternity praising you and thanking you. Please speak to us and change us today, we pray. All this in your powerful name. I've been wrestling with purpose. What was I created for? I'm more than what you see on the surface. See beneath my skin and scars. I'm skinned and scarred, marred and twisted, scarred by the past I need to be lifted. And sometimes I question my own existence. What was I put here for? In my seams, it seems that there seems to be more. It's like I'm a light, unplugged from the socket. I mean, do I really exist to put money in my pocket? This nine to five feels like a nine to nine. My mind entwined, I pass the time. Life circles me as I wait. What is my estate? I feel like I was made for something great, and yet I can't quite put my finger on it. But when I look at my fingers and I see their design, I realize I'm one of a kind. And something created me. No, someone created me. And that someone made me for a reason. Even though it's clear the past years have been treason, I still sense this drawing, this calling, that even in the midst of my falling, there was someone who died to pick me up. Someone who rose to fix me up. Someone who's coming back to lift me up. And that someone is Jesus. See, God made me for a purpose. And when I delight in him, it's brought to the surface. How's everybody doing today? Everybody good? It's Easter. You guys made it. <laughs> Appreciate you guys being here. Uh, thank you for inviting. And uh, if it's your first time, thank you so much for uh, braving it out and coming and just being a part of this. Uh, I know coming to a new church sometimes can be a little bit scary. Kind of what am I getting myself into? But uh, praise God, uh, you're able to come today. Uh, my hope, no matter uh, why you are here today, if you, uh, if you come all the time and you're just excited because of what Jesus Christ did for you, or if it's your first time, whether you know the Lord or you don't, right? My hope is that uh, we can present this in a way today where you can just be filled up, that you can get something out of God's word. Hopefully today, I don't know about you, but I enjoyed that choir. I'll be honest with you. That was, that was a nice little choir, right? Get the organ next year. We're going to get the organ out. We're going we're gonna to get crazy next year. Um, the first service, we did see some Easter hats. Uh, there's no Easter hats I see today. I think you get, we need to step up our Easter hat game next year as well, all right? So that's the goal, all right? But you guys are looking a little bit, uh, a little bit more sharp, a little more dapper than normal, so um, that's awesome. Easter's amazing, right? I mean, we do crazy stuff, right? We dress up, we like put suit coats on and stuff. Like, we like hide eggs, we do all kinds of things. Like, why do we do this stuff? It's, of course, because we are celebrating uh, what Jesus Christ did. Can you imagine, like, if America was not a Christian nation? It would be a boring place. No Christmas, no Easter, right? Like, all these major holidays are incredible incredible that we get to celebrate, and it's based, of course, on Christianity. So thank you for coming here today, whether you were drugged here by your girlfriend or your mom or your grandma, right, or whether you came here and you were excited, may, may your heart soften a little bit today, all right? My hope is that if you got your guard up and you're kind of like, oh, I don't know about this guy up there, like, I'm normal, right? I'm just like you, okay? I'm normal, okay? Like, but just let your, just let your guard down a little bit today. Allow God to kind of work on you, because I'm telling you, like, what we're going to talk about Right, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What we're gonna talk about today is, is not just for me. And it's not just for the people that typically go to church, but it's for every single one of us. It's for you and it's for me. 
And so today we're going to talk this through. We're going to try to dig in a little bit and just kind of give us, you know, reasons why we should believe and what it is, it's what it's about. So let me ask a question real quick on the front end of this. Uh, when was the last time uh, that you made a pretty good promise? When was the last time you made a promise? Go ahead and think that through. Uh, maybe it was a good promise. Maybe it was a bad promise. Um, did, you, did you hold to that promise, right? That's the next question. When was the last time you made a promise and did you actually carry it out? Because promises have weight, right? Um, yesterday, I'll be honest with you, I was kind of forced into a promise. Um, I was uh, up in, uh, a little bit early because, you know, the next day is Easter. And if you do what I do for a living, kind of an important day. So I was zipping around and it was about nine o'clock and I realized, you know what? I need to try to find a new white shirt uh, because my old one was not stretchy. All right. So I needed to find a new one. And so uh, it was nine o'clock and I looked and the only thing open was either Walmart Walmart or Kohl's. And so I chose Kohl's, right? So you don't have a pastor that goes to fancy boutiques. I go to Kohl's, right? That's where I shop, all right? So I show up at Kohl's, first one in, nine o'clock. I go in there, get my little white shirt and uh, a few other things. And so I get to the cash register and this lady, she, she's ringing me out and she's like, so uh, are you a part of our rewards club? I'm like, Ma'am, does it look like I like seriously? Like I come on, like I'm a, I'm like the first one in here on a Saturday morning. Like I only got a couple of things. Like no, I am not. And she's like, oh okay. She's like, well maybe your wife is. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, maybe she is. So you know, I, I put my wife's number in, and she's like, sure enough, my wife is a reward member at Kohl's. I'm like, oh that makes total sense. And uh, so she's like, oh she has ten dollars on her account. I'm like, oh okay, let's go ahead and use that. Oh, you know, you know, I didn't know, you know, right? Like, you don't do that, you don't do that. Like, I'll steal her reward points at like Walgreens all the time. She doesn't know it, right? But at Kohl's, like, oh man. So this lady looked at me like I was from another planet. I'm not even kidding you. And, and uh, so she's sitting there looking at it and she, I, I'm pretty sure she lied to me. She goes, oh, that $10, that's not, that's not redeemable until next month. I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? And so, you know, I go through it. She hands me the receipt and then she hands me this, right? <gasps> the Kohl's cash. Oh, yeah. And I, lo <laughs> I looked at it. I was like, man, there's $50 on here. I'm like, no way. I can get all kinds of good. Then she did it. And she's like, she knew I wasn't going to come back, right? She's like, you need to promise me that you were going to give that Kohl's cash to your wife. <laughs> I was like... I was kind of offended a little bit. I was like, all right, so I promise. So I'm going to make good. I'm going to give it to her as soon as the service is over, right? I'm not going to go shopping, I promise. Uh, but promises, right? They're important. Promises are important because if we uh, hold you our promises, that means the next time we make a promise, someone's going to believe us, right? Let's be honest. If you're a boss and you make a promise to your employee, hey, I know your schedule's crazy. You took on a number of things. Okay, the next time I put the schedule out, I'm going to make sure that you're okay. I'm going to move some things around. And what happens if the schedule comes out and all of a sudden you have the exact same schedules last time and you have the exact same problems, you are not going to what? Trust your boss next time. What happens mom and dad when we promise we're going to take the kids to Cedar Point and then it never happens all summer long, right? The next summer, what happens? We make that promise and then it's what? The kids are like, yeah, right. Okay, sure. Okay. And then of course you do it and then they're shocked, right? Because you held to your promise. But if you constantly come through Right, husbands, if we say we're going to pick up our clothes, right, and we pick up our clothes and all of a sudden you're, right, it's one of those things where we just, it's like you just keep building and building and building and building. And pretty much after like you, anything you say, the people around you are going to be like, no, he's good for it. He's good for his word. She's good for her word. It's going to happen. They said it. The yes is yes. The no is no. What if I could tell you like there has been a promise that has been made for every single human being that goes beyond anything else that's almost uncomprehensible, right? It's a promise that you can absolutely know what's going to happen to you when you pass on. Let's be honest today. Like it, most of us would agree that we have a little bit of fear of what comes next, right? We have a little bit of fear on the inside of what happens next. I've been, I grew up in church. I've had the scriptures. I've like read every story. I know what Jesus Christ did. I'll be honest with like, I, I, I like to pretend like I have no fear at all, but there's something on the inside that's like, ooh, right? Something's coming next. What if we have a promise? What if we have a promise of what's next? And we do. And it all revolves around this whole entire story that we look at at Easter time. To kind of set the stage real quick, so Jesus Christ, if we can go back to Friday, he's on the cross. Uh, they had to wake up real early and pull off some crazy shady stuff to get him onto a cross because, of course, the man was innocent. He was the only one that was sin-free. He was the only one that never messed up. He was the only one that never lied, and he ended up on a cross. Some bad things had to happen for him to get there. Trials took place all night. 
Trials are supposed to take place during the day, right? Not at nighttime, but they're taking place all throughout the night so that nine o'clock, what? Jesus Christ is on a cross. Two other people um, are on the cross as well, one to his left, one to his right. And when he shows up that day, they both have insults. They're both hurling insults. They're both saying all kinds of stuff to him. They're both just like very frustrated, of course, that they're there, but they're almost just taking it out on Jesus. And at some point in time, one of them has a heart change. At one point in time, one of them, their heart was hard at the beginning, kind of like, you know, some of us come in here, our heart's kind of like, Ugh. and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, he just, he let his guard down. His heart just absolutely changed. And so we kind of read about this. This is, if you can, if you have a copy of God's word, or you can go to it on your phone, or it'll come up behind me. But it's Luke uh, chapter 23, uh, verse 39. And uh, this is what it says. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Like, okay, if you're throwing insults at someone, you're not gonna, why would he ever wanna save you, right? Like, I don't get it. Save everybody and us too. Like, you know, but you're an idiot. You're like, what? Like, what are you doing? Like, it doesn't make any sense, right? The guy is not the brightest, apparently, right? Um, so verse 40, but the other criminals rebuked him. Don't you fear God? Like, at some point in time, that man is up there going, oh my goodness, here's the deal. Like, he's on this cross. Everybody thinks it's like way up high in the sky. I mean, it's like, it's almost ground level. So people can go by and yell and scream and say all kinds of things. I mean, you can imagine this man up there like hearing conversations. People think the people that were there that day, right, were the ones that were yelling, crucify, crucify, crucify. There were some that were there, but Jesus also had a following that was there. His mother was there. His friends were there. His, his dis one disciple was there. I mean, they, you can imagine him overhearing these conversations about what Jesus Christ did and the miracles that he did and the people that he raised from the dead. You can imagine him just going, oh my goodness, this guy is something. This guy is not normal. And all of a sudden, what, his heart starts to change, and he almost, he starts rebuking the other guy. He goes on, he says, but the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what we, our, our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. And this next verse, verse 42, you can see this man's, it's amazing, but you can see this man's, like, the moment in time of this man's salvation. Salvation is unique, right? Because it's a moment in time in your life where you finally go, oh, man, I can't save myself. I can't do it myself. I need something else. It's that moment in time where you, tra you transfer your trust in yourself to an almighty Savior. It's that time where you, with your soul, you're confessing that you need a Messiah, Right, and this is like, it's so brief, it's so simple, it's so easy. It almost doesn't seem like, oh, there's gotta be more to it than this. But here it is, you ready for this? Verse 42, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I mean, my goodness, that's so beautiful. <laughs> remember me when you come into your kingdom. That man, we don't know how he got to that cross, but he got to that cross. He ends up besides the Messiah. All of a sudden, he realized what's going on. People in the crowd, there's all kinds of stuff happening. And all of a sudden, he gets to that spot where he says, oh my, I, I need whatever you have, I need. The man didn't get baptized, right? He didn't help any old ladies cross the road. He didn't do anything, right? He didn't speak into nothing, right? What did he do? He just simply confessed with his mouth. He confessed with his mouth. Hey, you know what? I, just remember me. Remember me. And the next words out of Jesus Christ's mouth, here's the promise. You ready for this? Here's the amazing promise that we see, verse 43. It said, Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. What if I could tell you today that uh, truly, you will be with Jesus Christ in paradise? Truly, you can know what comes next, what happens after. A lot of us in this room have gotten to that spot where we have sealed the deal, right? We have, we have buttoned it up, we have figured it out, we have literally gotten alone with God or in a public place and said, God, I need you, I need you, I'm a sinner, I'm messed up, I need you. And we've gotten to that spot of salvation, here is this man's salvation, right? And of course, when we get to that spot today, man, we will be with him in paradise, we will be with him in heaven. It's incredible, it's a promise. But the promise is only good the promise is only good if Sunday comes, right? Because if Sunday doesn't come and he doesn't come back from the grave, man, it's game over. It's game over. Because he was making these really crazy accusations. He was saying these things. He was saying, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. And then three days later, guess what? I'm going to come back. And three days later, I'm going to show back up. And you know what they would do in the Old Testament time? Right? They would say, if this, someone started making crazy claims and they were acting like a prophet, you know what they would typically do? They would say, you know what, okay, go ahead, let's see their crazy claims and then let's see if they come true. And if they do not come true, this man's false, 
right? This woman's false, and therefore, you know what the penalty was? Death, right? They took it pretty serious. Here's Jesus saying, you know what? I'm gonna die. So they're like, okay, go ahead. Let's find, let's see what happens. And then sure enough, three days later, Sunday comes. Man, he's calling a shot, right? He's calling a shot. Can we believe this? Is this worth believing? I mean, this is crazy. Like, you think about this. I mean, if we mention this today, like, hey, you know what? Somebody just came back from the dead yesterday. Oh, my goodness. Like, most of us would be like, no way. That's impossible. That's crazy. 2,000 years ago, this happened. There has to be some proof, right? There has to be something to this. Do you know that Jesus Christ, as a historical figure upon this earth, has more written about him than the emperors of Rome? Like, you cannot deny that Jesus Christ lived on this planet when you start doing the setting and start understanding what he was all about, I mean, the man did not like go outside of his little geographical area. I mean, to be this well-known is over the top. He should not be this well-known, but yet he is. And yet we still talk about him today. There was a uh, professor at Oxford University. If you're gonna quote any, you know, any place, Oxford, all right, here we go. Let's quote a professor from Oxford. This dates back a little bit, but this is what this man said, all right? He wrote a lot of different things. He said, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ has been shown to be satisfactory according to the standards of any historian. It holds up in distinguishing good evidence from bad. Thousands of persons have gone through it piece by piece, as careful as a judge, reviewing an important case. I have myself done this over and over, not to persuade others, but to satisfy myself. We have to get to a spot where we satisfy ourselves. Throughout my life, I have made a career out of studying the history of times and events, examining and weighing the evidence for what was written about each of them. And I know of no other fact in history that has been proven better with fuller evidence than this one. Jesus Christ died and rose again from the dead. So what you do with the resurrection matters. What you do with this event matters. Now people say, you know what, I can't trust the Bible. I, if creation is true and Genesis 1-1 is true and this event is true, then man, you can just, you can look at the Bible and go, oh my goodness, all this is true, <laughs> right? We don't, we, we don't have to sit there and nitpick. We can just say, my goodness, you know what, it's game over. This one event does everything for us. And so what do we do, of course, with this today? So let's fast forward, shall we? Let's go to Sunday morning. It's great. It's amazing. Um, there's um, some ladies that are getting up and uh, they decide they need to go make sure that, um, you know, everything was done proper because let's be honest, you know, the men put Jesus in the grave and they did what they did. So the ladies were like, let's go make, it's in the Bible. I swear to you, it's in the Bible. So they decide, you know what, we're going to go. And you know what they're fully expecting? They're expecting someone to be dead. Why? Because dead people typically stay dead. That's what happens. All right. So they're looking and they're going, you know what, let's go to the, let's go to the grave. And, and there's no conversation at all about, oh my goodness, I can't wait to see the, the, the stone rolled away. I just, it's going to be so amazing. There was no talk of like any, anything supernatural at all. And when they start going to the grave that day, things start to happen and things start to get crazy. It was a day that they would never forget. And it was a day that they would repeat to many, many people over and over and over. And we see it in Matthew chapter 28, verse one. It says, after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to, the, went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, rock shaking, ground splitting, trees falling over. We don't really know what earthquakes are really. Right? I remember in fourth grade, there was an earthquake. I was like, really? There was? Okay. Right? If you lived on the West Coast, maybe. But this was, people were feeling this. People understood this. They knew something was taking place because it just happened the same way three days prior when Jesus Christ, of course, was forsaken by the Father. So now we see it happening again. There's a violent earthquake and he goes on. He says, the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. I, I've never been that scared. I'll be honest with you. I've been scared. I've been scared, right? Don't sneak up on me when I'm trying to work, right? You'll scare me to death. But like, I've never been so scared that I just sit there and shake. I mean, this is a, this is a strange phenomenon, right? They, were, they saw something that was over the top supernatural, over the top. An angel said to the woman, do not be afraid. I love this phrase. I'll be honest with you. This phrase is all through scripture. Do not be afraid. It's one of the most quoted phrases in scripture. It's one of the most common phrases in scripture. It's like God knew that we would be people that had fear in our hearts, 
right? You throw the supernatural on it and our, our enemy just wants us to be afraid of everything. Go back to 2020, we didn't know what to be afraid of, what not to be afraid of, right? I mean, it's just, it's one thing that you see over and over and over and sure enough, this angel's like, don't be afraid. He goes on, he says, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, he is risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead to you in Galilee. There you will see him, now I have told you. Man, he called a shot, right? He said he was going yard, he went yard. He pointed to the outfield and he took care of it. I mean, he called it. Now, I grew up in the, uh, I grew up in the 80s and uh, I love watching basketball and um, Michael Jordan is absolutely the GOAT, I'll be honest with you. So we can just kind of clear that up real quick. And, um, <laughs> um, but uh, I also watched another man, his name was Larry Bird. And um, if you've never seen Larry Bird, you just, just, just know this, the man should not be able to trash talk anybody, but yet he can, right? You just look at him you're like, oh, come on, that dude can't ball. He could ball, right? And what he would do was crazy because they would interview after interview after interview. They would ask him and say, hey, what was it like going up against Larry Bird? And he said, you know what he would do? He would call his shot. He would literally tell you exactly what he was going to do. I'm going to get the ball over here. And he had this like Southern twang, right? Or this Indiana twang. He's like, I'm going to get the ball over here. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to roll. I'm going to spin. I'm going to shoot it from the J and it's going to go in right over you. Sure enough, he would do it. And he would do that over and over and over. Could imagine playing against someone like that, calling their shot, then actually doing it. And this is, of course, what Jesus Christ did when he came back. Who calls this shot? This isn't like, I'm going to go shoot a, a basket over top of you. No, this was, hey, I'm going, I'm going in the grave for a bit. And I'm going to do some stuff I'm in the grave. I'm going to do a little bit of preaching, hanging out with the people there in paradise. You know what? And then I'm going to bring paradise with me. And you know what? We're going to come back after three days. And sure enough, Sunday morning. If Sunday morning doesn't happen, toss the whole thing out. The cross is irrelevant. Our religion is re re relevant. Nothing we do makes sense. Easter Sunday, let's just not do it because it doesn't make sense. But the fact that he came back, it changes everything. It changes everything. And so you look at it and you just go, okay, you know what? Is there more reasons that I can believe? Maybe you're just like, you know what? I've listened to a lot of stuff and I've watched a lot of things and I don't know if I can believe I just don't know. But know this, like when you look at the scripture, archaeology, right? When you think of apologetics, right? Like why I can believe, like defending the faith. Like archaeology literally keeps proving scripture to be correct over and over and over and over. There was a city that was uh, mentioned in the Old Testament over and over and over. And skeptics kept saying, you know what? Bible's inaccurate. You know, scriptures are inaccurate. That city does not exist. What happens? They find the city. It's like the city of the Hittite like, community. Like over and over and over, this just keeps happening. Like, like archaeology just proves that we can trust. You think of this scenario, right? If they're truly making this up, if they're really truly making this story up, they would not start it out with Matthew 28 with two or three women coming to the grave. It would not happen. Women could not go to court and be a witness, right? If you're making this stuff up, you would start with it completely different. And let's be honest, if they were making this stuff up and this was just all some fairy tale, why did the first century church experience so much persecution and yet they went through it? It doesn't make sense. I'm not dying for a lie. I'm not getting tortured for a lie. You can't even punch me for a lie, right? Like no way, it ain't happening, right? But yet this entire community, right? This first century community, right? Persecution, persecution, persecution over and over. Every single person that was closest to Jesus went to a pretty bad death. I don't know about you, but there's no way, there's no chance that would happen unless it was true, unless it happened. And of course, eyewitnesses start to write it down and we see it, of course, today. You know, I, I, I step back off of this and I just say, you know what? I, to me, I, <laughs> it makes more sense to believe it than not to believe it. It really does. It really does. You go on in verse eight. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. Have you ever been there? Like you're, you're scared, but you're excited and you're, there's joy in you. And ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greeting, he said. They came to him, collapsed his feet and worshiped him. When was the last time you seen that? When was the last time you went to the mall and you saw somebody like so excited and they ran over and they like literally collapsed and they started like grabbing their feet? Never, ever, ever have I ever seen that, ever. I mean, maybe like, hey, oh, I haven't seen you in a while. Give me a little side hug, right? You know, fist bump, high fives. I know that wasn't invented for like 50 years ago. Uh, but like, you never see anyone grabbing somebody's feet. This is the appropriate response to see somebody that just came back from the grave three days earlier, right? Like, or just came back from the grave that was killed three days earlier. 
This is what we should see. People blown away. People amazed. The fact that Jesus Christ came to this group of people, right, to show him, right? And then, of course, he kept coming back over and over and, of course, proved himself many times to many different people over the next 40 days. So you see this, and it goes on in verse 10. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to, the, uh, to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Head north. Go up to the lake, right? Go up to the lake, the Sea of Galilee. I'm gonna, we're going to cook some food up. I'm going to make them some breakfast, and this is what happens, which is pretty cool. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had been happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say that his disciples came during the night and stole him away while you were asleep. That is the worst, like, lie ever. You know, and what they do? They went with it. They decided to go for it. They decided, you know what, we're going to do this. I'll be honest, this last, uh, this last week, everything kind of started hitting the fan. You probably caught wind of like all the Nickelodeon stuff and just all the just creepy, horrible things that were happening with a number of the shows, you know, just with the underage, you know, actors. And it's just like, we were watching parts of this and I'll be honest, my wife and I were just getting more angry and more angry and more angry. We're like, where are the adults? Where are the parents? Where are the, 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 where are the people that should be protecting other people? And story after story after story after story was anyone that stood up, what? They were, of course, they would get fired. But there were so many people that just went with it. They just went with it. Why? Because the money was good, right? Because if that stops, right, and I say something, right, if I say something and, and I draw attention to that, then you know what? I won't have favor and therefore what? It's, it's selling out, selling out, selling out, selling out. These guards, they literally were so afraid they were shaking, right? They were shaking. You know they went and told somebody. You know they did. But here we go. We see it in verse 14. The report gets to the governor. We will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. There it is, right? It's the cover-up. Why? Because we can't have this out there. We can't have this. Why not? The most amazing event ever in the history of the world. No, we can't have that out there. Why? Because it disrupts what I'm used to. It disrupts my, my beliefs. It disrupts my religion. Man, it's still kind of the same today, right? Because if you really give in to this thing called the resurrection of Jesus Christ, like him coming back from the grave, all of a sudden we have to start doing something with that. We have to look at it square in the face and say, okay, if this is true, then you know what? And I believe in him, then I have to change some stuff. I got to figure out my lifestyle. Am I, am, I, am I doing what I should be doing? Am I, should I be doing some different things? Like, I don't know if God's happy with what I'm doing. And it makes us, of course, look at a mirror. And this is why so many people want to just push it away and push it away and push it away. You know, you look at, you know, the thieves on the cross. It's amazing, right? Because the one, how do we know him? Well, the one, of course, he was sitting there just, you know, slandering Jesus and saying all kinds of just, you know, really rough stuff and things that he should not be saying. But the other one, like, what do we know about him? His heart was hard. It softened up. He said, remember me. And of course, today you'll be with me in paradise. When we see him someday, nobody asks him, hey, what'd you do to get on the cross? All right, don't ask him that, okay? Like, when we see him today, we're going to be like, oh my goodness, you were the one. You were the one that was on the cross. That was you? Right, that was you, like you're, you're, the past is gone, right? No one's gonna ask, oh man, did you kill a guy? How'd you get up there? Like, what, what happened? Like, no one's gonna care. But guess what? Guess what? When we get up there, no one's gonna be asking you either. No one's gonna be asking you the, your worst day ever. We've all, had a, we've all had a worst day, right? Isn't it weird to think that your worst day might be coming? Ooh, ooh. Pray, I pray not, right? I pray that all of our worst days are in our past. You know, but man, there's gonna be some dark days, some difficult days ahead potentially, and we might make some stupid decisions and do something that we would regret and something that we would never dream we would ever get to that spot of doing. And guess what? If you give your life to Jesus Christ, he forgives that darkest day. What a beautiful thing that is. Why would you not wanna like roll with that, right? Why would you not wanna go, man, that sounds, so, that sounds too good to be true, it does, doesn't it? It really does. The empty tomb proves that paradise um, was not an empty promise. I'll be honest with you, I've been doing a, a decent amount. <laughs> Seems like our staff, we've been doing a decent amount of hospital visits and funerals and just, it's, it's difficult. It changes you a little bit. It's kind of like someone that is um, 
like an employer, and you have to, you, you're the one that has to fire people, you walk away from that a little bit changed, I'll be honest with you, right? You see someone's life kind of change because you had to give some information. You, know, you go to the hospital and you talk with someone they know they only have days left, and you talk with them. You know what's so amazing is when you talk with someone and they have literally, when they tell you, oh, I love Jesus so much, you walk away because they are close, right? I mean, it's like that thief on the cross. He was close. He was at that moment. Right? I, I leave going, thank you, Jesus, for what you did for me. Thank you, Jesus, that the hope of heaven is there for me just like it is for them. All right, there's something that I read at a lot of uh, uh, different funerals that I do, and it's, it's, not, it's not sad and sappy, but it's, it's, to me it's encouraging. I love reading this. Um, it's about uh, Dwight L. Moody. He was a uh, famous uh, evangelist. We don't really hear of evangelists a whole lot. Someone goes around and just preaches and just like, man, just hammers the word of God, which is pretty cool. Uh, but this is, he was, you know, entering, he was like that last, you know, he was on his deathbed. He was getting to that spot. And so this is what it says. Dwight L. Moody said, someday you will read in the papers that D.L. Moody of Northfield is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? At that moment, I should be more alive than I am now. I shall have gone higher, that is all, out of this old clay tenement into a house that is immortal, a body that sin cannot touch, that sin cannot taint, a body fashioned into his glorious body. I was born in flesh in 1837. I was born of the spirit in 1856. That which is born of the flesh may die. That which is born of the spirit will live forever. Your spirit will live forever. You can't deny that. This is not it. This is not it. This is a fraction of eternity. This part here is small compared to what we get to experience someday. Your spirit will go on. It goes on, he says, a few hours before entering the homeland, Dwight L. Moody caught a glimpse of the glory awaiting him. Awakening from sleep, he said, earth recedes, heaven opens before me. If this is death, it is sweet. There is no valley here. God is calling me and I must go. His son was standing by his bedside and said, no, no, father, you, you are dreaming. No, said Mr. Moody, I am not dreaming. I have been within the gates. I have seen the faces. A short time elapsed and he spoke again. This is my triumph. This is my coronation day. It is glorious. Man, I've heard of all kinds of stories and people have told me and I've been there where, you know, someone's getting close and it's like they see heaven open up. They see the angels. It's real, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. As much as we don't wanna believe, because if we do believe, that means it's a little bit scary. It means we have to figure out some things. It means, to, it means we need to face some things we don't wanna face. But once you do, once you give your life to Jesus Christ, once you say, you know what, it's, it's your will, not my will, oh, it's the greatest day of your life. It's the day of your salvation. So we got two options, right? We can either scorn him, or we can surrender. We can scorn them, right? We can say, you know what, no way, no way, no way. Push them away. Be mad at every church person ever, right? I'm not gonna go to church. I'm not gonna go to that building because of all the hypocrites. I heard this the other day. Like saying that is like, I'm not gonna go to the gym because of all the people that are out of shape. <laughs> Think about it. Like seriously, like we are, we are, it's like a hospital for the broken. We're trying to do better. May we do better tomorrow than we did today. May we be less hypocritical next week than we were this week, right? May we keep, we, may we, it's like that progressive sanctification is trying to be better and better and better because of what Jesus Christ did for us, not because we want a pat on the back, right? That's why, we, that's why we strive to be better. That's why we strive to be truthful. That's why we strive to come through on the promises that we say and our yes is yes and our no is no. That's why we pray. That's why we fast. There were so many of you this week. I was so, oh my goodness, overwhelmed at how many of you fasted for the very first time. Boy, that'll make you hangry, right? That'll make you upset. But you know what? It's so good spiritually because you're denying yourself. You're doing something different for the Lord and you're focusing on him. And of course, what he did. You know, it's like you can scorn him or you can surrender to him. You know, it's like, are you trying to convert me? You know, <laughs> yes, yes, right? <laughs> right, like in a way that, in a way that I'm trying to, the goal, honestly, coming here on a Sunday morning, why, why do we go through this? You know, this, you know the parking outside, right? Um, the local Seven Hills Facebook page lit up this week. Um, 
Yeah, we had some problems. Um, <laughs> we were trying to get that gravel in and one thing after another, rain, you name it, right? But we got it in, but it took some late nights. Um, why were we like stressing? Why were we out here like literally yesterday still trying to figure this so that people could come in here and park cars? Well, why? So that it could be a good experience. Well, why? So that you could just sit back and just go, okay, you know what? I'm going to settle in and I'm going to hear from the Lord. I'm going to hear from the Lord. Why? <laughs> because what he did for you is so incredible. And the only thing that we're trying to convert anybody to is to follow Jesus Christ. That's it. Because guess what? When you, when you chase Jesus, when you get to that day of salvation for you, the Holy Spirit decides to come on in and take up residence, and he's not leaving. And he helped you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is the promise of God for your life. This is the promises that we see. And let me tell you, God comes through on his promises. There's one last passage that I have, and it's just like, okay, if we're going to go up, what does that mean? And Jesus had something to say about this. Um, this comes from John chapter 14, verse 1. It says this. He's talking to a, uh, a decent-sized group. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. We're hearing this again, right? So if you got some fear, you got some anxiety, you got some trouble going on in your heart, man, may, may today be a day where you just decide, you know what, I'm going to just go ahead and give that over to the Lord. When you do that, when you give that to the Lord, I'm telling you, it's amazing, right? You don't have to carry that. Let him carry that. He goes on, he says, uh, you believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Whew. This is better than any lotto house, right? This is better than Joanna Gaines. This is better than any kind of fix, whatever, I don't know. Any kind, like anything you see on TV. This is like, we, are, we get to go be with the Lord. He is, we get to go walk on streets of gold. We get to go through gates made of pearl. We get to go to a place where there's no more crying or tears. Like we get to go to a place where there's no more hunger. Man, I can't wait, no more pain. Sounds like an amazing place. Jesus Christ has gone to prepare a place for you. It's a promise. If it were not true, he would not have said it. <laughs> and he said it. He's got a place for you and you and you and you and you and me. <laughs> we get to spend eternity forever in heaven with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what do you do with the resurrection? Has there been a moment in time in your life where you've truly said, you know what, God? Man, I'm gonna live for you. Has there been a moment in time where you've really, really, truly went to the Lord and said, you know what, I, I put my trust in you. Scripture says really clear that there are none righteous, no, not one. And when we confess with our mouth, right, unto the Lord, right, it says that we are saved. Is there a day of salvation that you can look back at and go, that was the day, that was the time, that was the moment. May Easter 2024 be the day that you get to that spot where you say, you know what? This is the day. This is the time. This is, this is, when, I, <laughs> this is when I declared with my mouth. This is when I talked to God. And this was the day that I decided, you know what? I want to live for him. Can I get y'all to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a little bit? And we're just going to talk to the Lord a little bit, do a little more worship, be finished up. If you've never gotten to that spot where you've given your life to the Lord, I encourage you today, this is your day. This is your time. This is the moment. I encourage you, I'm gonna pray and I encourage you just to pray right along with me. You and him. Time for you to do business. It's not between anybody around you. It's not between your wife, your husband, your kids, your grandparents, nobody else. This is you and the Lord. If there is any doubt in your heart at all, man, today is the day to get that figured out. I encourage you to pray in this way. God, I love you so much. Lord, I love you. I wanna be with you someday in paradise. I wanna be with you someday in heaven. Lord, I believe that you died on a cross for me. I believe you took the nails for me. I believe that you wore the crown of thorns, Lord, for my sin. And Lord, I believe that you were forsaken by the Father because of my sin. Lord, I confess I need a savior. Lord, I believe that you went to a cross so that I could be with you. Lord Jesus, I wanna live for you all the days of my life. 
I surrender my life to you. Lord, I just pray that we can spend these last few moments lifting you up as high as we possibly can. Lord, because Sunday came and you came back from that grave and you came, you came through with your promise, Lord, not just for me, but for every single person. And Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we can't stop thanking you for that. And Lord, my prayer is for that person that gave their life to you for the very first time today, Lord. Lord, may this be a day unlike any other day for them, Lord. Lord, may they wake up tomorrow asking you what they can do for you, Lord. May we do your will tomorrow, Lord. May we do your will this next week, next month, next year, Lord. May we chase you harder than we've ever chased you before, Lord. Lord, we surrender our lives to you. Lord, we thank you for the cross. But Lord, we thank you that you did not stay on that cross, Lord. You went to the grave, Lord. You spent three days and you made good on your promise. You came back. And Lord, I thank you for that. What a blessing, Lord. I pray these things in your name. Let's stand and worship him one more time. Glory 
son of suffering for you and for me. May this week we go and just remember what he's done for us personally. Um, if you've given your life to Christ today, man, we would love to know about it. We have a, our prayer team's gonna come up after. I encourage you to pray with them. Uh, I encourage you to ask them any questions you would like. If you have any prayer needs or anything heavy on you, I encourage you to stick around. Let Easter continue just for a little bit, right? A little uh, picture area will be all right. Uh, just waiting for a few extra minutes. I encourage you, of course, just to, man, be sensitive to the Lord. 
Um, thank you, of course, for coming. God, we love you. Uh, we lift you up, Lord. What a blessing it is to be able to praise your name, Lord, in such an amazing way, Lord. You are the son of suffering, Lord. You, you suffered for every single one of us, Lord. And for that, we thank you. For that, we worship you, Lord. For that, we are able to stand free and clear. Okay, Lord, staying free uh, before you. Uh, what a blessing that is, Lord. So help us to go out this week and uh, with our heads high, Lord, and just, uh, just knowing that we have a God that will never leave us nor forsake us, Lord. May we look back at the day of our salvation and just be encouraged, Lord. And may we just understand what you did for us every single day, Lord. And we chase your will. And we pray these things in your name. And all God's people said, Amen. thanks for coming today.